This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. Our reading this morning is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 10. Psalm 10. Hear the word of God. Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes he devises. He boasts of the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and reviles the Lord. In his pride, the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. His ways are always prosperous. He is haughty, and your laws are far from him. He sneers at his enemies. He says to himself, nothing will shake me. I'll always be happy and never have trouble. His mouth is full of curses and lies and threats. Trouble and evil are under his tongue. He lies in wait near the villages. From ambush he murders the innocent, watching in secret for his victims. He lies in wait like a lion in cover. He lies in wait to catch the helpless. He catches the helpless and drags them off in his net. His victims are crushed, they collapse, they fall under his strength. He says to himself, God has forgotten. He covers his face and never sees. Arise, O Lord. Lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. Why does a wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, he won't call me to account? But you, God, do see trouble and grief. You consider it to take it in hand. The victim commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evil man. Call him to account for his wickedness that would not be found out. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his hand. You hear, O Lord, the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed in order that man who is of the earth may terrify no more. Amen. Our second reading this morning comes from Romans, and we're going to be looking at chapter 9. You'll find that on page 1135 of the Bibles in the Pews. Romans chapter 9. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It is not as though God's word had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. 
nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebecca's children, Rebecca's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who resists his will? But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, born with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy? whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And it will happen that in in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the Israelites be like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom we would have been like Gomorrah. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. But the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Amen. You may find it helpful to have that passage, Romans chapter 9, open before you this morning as we continue our series on this book. Lurking beneath the stresses and anxieties of modern life lie the same old questions. Am I in a right relationship with God? And if I'm not on this Remembrance Sunday, can I ever be good enough to meet God's approval? Have I done enough to deserve His love and to know, really know, that when I get to the gates of heaven, God will say to me, come on in, 
you're very welcome, you're part of my family. The letter which the Apostle Paul wrote to the early Christians in Rome around the year AD 62 is a masterful overview of the gospel, reminding the believers, both from Jewish and Gentile backgrounds, that while none of us are ever good enough to merit salvation, and although we can never do enough to earn God's approval, yet know this, Jesus is. And by placing our full faith in Christ and in Him alone, we can be absolutely certain, chapter 8, verse 1, that there is now no condemnation, none for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, some of you, I am aware, are still not quite sure about that because you've told me you're not yet certain that God really loves you that amount, sufficient to forgive you all your sins without you trying to do something else to contribute to your salvation. And so, for you, especially for you, I have acquired a quantity of this brand new book. I've got 50 of them by Dr. Michael Reeves, which is called Right with God. This book ordinarily retails for four pounds, but in order to make the point that salvation genuinely is a free gift, this book is available for you this morning in each foyer at no cost whatsoever. Of course, it cost someone something in order to make it available today, but for you, the book is free because I long and the elders in this place long that none of you may go from here knowing, not knowing this rock-solid assurance that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers nor the height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what I long for every person here this morning to know, that you are loved unconditionally. Now, having explained in chapters 1 to 8 this great good news of God's amazing grace, which is found in Jesus Christ, where Jesus does for us what we could never do for ourselves, Paul now, in this middle section of his letter, chapters 9 through to 11, starts to respond to some questions that some people will ask. Questions such as, Paul, you said in chapter 8, verse 30, that those God chose, He also justified. Those He justified, He also glorified. Now, if that is the case, what about the Jews? Way back from the time of Abraham, God gave the Jewish people special privileges. But since then, some of them, most of them, have failed to believe in Jesus as Messiah. Does that then mean that God's promises, His power, or His mercy has been without purpose? Or to make it even more stark for us, if the Jewish people, in verses 4 and 5, who have had a whole host of special privileges and advantages, if they haven't all been saved, what chance have we? Is our future destiny any more secure than theirs? Think about it from this Old Testament perspective for a moment. And here, um, Paul traces seven fantastic privileges which the Jewish people had enjoyed. You can see them in verses 4 and 5. First of all, God had separated Abraham and his family from all the nations of the world to be His people upon whom His affection would be lavished. Behold, Israel is my son, it says in Exodus 4 verse 22. Theirs was the adoption of sons. 
So here's privilege number one for the Jewish people, sonship. Um, And then more than that, theirs was the divine glory right through their journey. You remember out of slavery into the promised land, God had supernaturally and spectacularly dwelt among His people. His Shekinah glory, His bright, wonderful presence had traveled along with them and never left them day nor night. What a privilege that had been for the children of Israel to have experienced God's glory. Thirdly, theirs were the covenants, these visual aids these amazing unilateral agreements that God had entered into with Israel, signs and seals of God's prior love to them, which they were called to to receive by faith. Circumcision, Passover, theirs were the covenants of grace. Fourthly, theirs were the receiving of the law, that is the precious Torah, the Ten Commandments. God had entrusted these holy laws, not to the goyim, the Gentile outsiders, but to Moses and the Hebrew people. Fifthly, theirs were the temple worship. Not only was the temple one of the most beautiful buildings ever constructed, but it was also a place where worship could be offered and atonement made to Almighty God, the creator and sustainer of the entire earth. What a blessing! And sixthly, theirs were the promises made to Israel of a wonderful time when the people of God would lead all the peoples of the world. There would be a universal reign of shalom. A glorious king would rule out of Jerusalem, bringing universal peace and righteousness. Theirs were the promises. And seventhly, and most perfectly, verse 5, theirs were the patriarchs, Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, King David, and now the supreme and most incredible blessing of all, the eternal, everlasting second member of the Holy Trinity become a human being who also happened to be a Jew. How come then that in spite of all these fantastic, amazing advantages, achievements, and possibilities, the Jewish people of Paul's day were so violently anti-Christian. Is God really able to save someone whom He calls? Or to make it up to date for us, is our salvation any more secure than theirs? Well, it's a very important question. Here we are, a group of God's people gathered here today in this particular place at this specific time, and we too are a privileged people. Many of us have been brought up within a loving, caring Christian environment. We have received blessing upon blessing through the life and witness of this or another congregation. We've been nurtured in creche and kid zone and merge and boys brigade and guides. We've received the sacraments of baptism and communion. We've benefited from, from the preaching, from the teaching, from the prayer, from the connect groups, from morning and evening worship, from scripture union, from camps, from crusaders, from Christian union at college or university, from great Christian books. Look at the countless spiritual advantages we have had. Now, for all those privileges, have all of us submitted to Jesus as Lord? Oh, says Paul in chapter 9, verse 1, and here I am speaking the truth. I have huge sorrow, unceasing anguish in my heart for you. Because I know that in spite of all that you've already received, there are some here who have still got hard and resistant, stubborn hearts, who have not yet repented or responded to Christ. And states Paul, and here he is speaking, of course, first and foremost of his own beloved Jewish brothers and sisters. He says, I feel this so deeply. I myself would be prepared to spend the rest of my eternity in hell, verse 3. 
if only you were to be in a right relationship with God. That's how much the apostle longed that those who had received so much by way of spiritual blessings might be saved. And so then I too must under compulsion make this urgent plea to you also. If there is anyone who has as yet not responded to Christ Jesus, don't hold back. Indeed, there's even a free book available this morning and in order to help you do that, to help you make the vital step of trusting in Jesus because of all that he has done for you on the cross so that on that great and terrible day of judgment, you are able to say with total and absolute assurance, I have been adopted and incorporated into God's own family. I know myself to be a daughter or son of the living Lord. Now, just before we finish, let's take a look at how these things worked out in the past. It's a wee bit early for, for that slide. Uh, thank you. I wonder if you can glance down in verses 7 to 13, about the examples of people who, like us, had similarly been privileged because they had been descended from Abraham. And yet, strangely enough, their destinies turned out to be utterly different. Do you see in verse 7, Abraham had two sons. There was Ishmael and there was Isaac. Isaac believed, whereas Ishmael didn't. How come? How come two boys brought up in a very similar environment should turn out to be so very different? One responding to God, the other rejecting him. And then look down at verse 10, where we see that Isaac himself, who had been blessed by God, he and his lovely wife, Rebecca, they had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And yet it says in verse 13 that Jacob was the one through whom the line of promise flowed, whereas Esau, although he was the older of the twins, was cut off from the promise. Are we able to work that out? Here's Jacob, the scheming, um, conniving younger brother. He's the one who ends up responding to God in faith, while the elder Esau hadn't the slightest care for the things of God and end up giving away his inheritance for a mess of pottage, rejecting his eternal salvation for a bowl of stew. Now, how are we able to explain that? Two people raised up in practically identical ways, and yet one responded to God and the other didn't. Two friends, given all the privileges and opportunities of a similar spiritual upbringing, and yet it's the unexpected one who gets converted and the other one who shows no discernible love of God whatsoever. Well, here Paul is anxious to let us know that while these things are beyond our human understanding, they are not outside God's. And none of these choices which people make towards him come as a surprise to God, nor do they shock him. And so, with the benefit of hindsight, looking back over history and thinking about what we can see right now, here are three things that are very plain for us to note, and here they are on the screen. The first one is this that salvation is never based on natural advantages. Salvation is never based on natural advantages. We can see that in verses 1 to 9. If it had been, then that would be unfair to those who had nothing. Secondly, salvation is never based on an individual's human behavior. Otherwise, that would be salvation by works. But rather, thirdly, salvation is always based on the promises of God. Now, now, are you in agreement with these three things? From what we've already learned from this letter of Paul to the Romans, 
that no one is righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement in whom we place our faith. From all that we've already discovered in this good news book, that although we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And since we've now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? And there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Having had these vital truths drummed into us, can we now agree with these three things that although ancestor, ancestry and education and opportunity and natural privileges are good, none of these things are sufficient to lead us to faith in Christ? Are you in agreement with that? Salvation has never been, nor ever will be, based on a person's natural advantages. That's the first thing we see. Then in addition, verses 10 to 13 tells us that even though we naturally imagine that it must impress God how good we are, from the Scriptures we see that salvation has never been brought about via particular behavior of any specific individual. If it had been, why would Christ have had to die for our sins? If we were able to make our own way to heaven, why would God need to have done for us what we could never do for ourselves? No, God's salvation has never been, nor will it ever be based on our good works. Are you still in agreement with that? Well then, thirdly and lastly, verses 14 to 18. Since salvation is not and never has been based on human desire or effort, verse 16, it rests entirely upon God and His mercy. In the words of the hymn which we sang this morning before the sermon, my Lord, I did not choose you. For that could never be. Why? Because if I was the one who chose to follow God, then I am still the one who is arrogant enough to suppose that I'm the one in charge, rather than God who does the saving. I'm not saved from my sins because of my decision. I am saved from my sins because of God's sheer mercy for me in Jesus. And if I am saved, then it's not thanks to me. It's not up to my decision to love God. It is purely thanks to God and to His promises that if the Spirit of Christ who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, chapter 8, verse 11, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to our mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in us. And as if to emphasize this point that salvation has to do with God and not me, because my decisions can shift like sifting sand blown by the wind on the seashore, if salvation has everything to do with Him, then stand amazed that the God who formed us out of clay, verse 20, clay which deserved nothing but destruction, has instead been fashioned and molded into useful pieces of pottery, verse 21, either for noble or for ordinary everyday purposes. It's God's privilege then to do with us as He will, but this is the basis of our assurance, God's sovereign mercy. What then shall we say to this, verse 30, about the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness yet obtained of salvation? What, what do we say about these people who are outsiders, who are nonetheless brought within the kingdom of God? What about the Israelites who although they had all the privileges, have not received salvation. How do we begin to get our heads around that? Because salvation has been given, and salvation has only ever been received, not by works, but by faith. 
not through anything I have ever attempted to do for God, but because of Jesus and all that He has done for me. But you see, and here we end, for many people that remains the problem. Here was the difficulty for the Jews of the Apostle Paul's day, and this remains the problem for Jewish people today, and is the same old problem for us as well. Jesus, verse 32, is the stumbling block. If Jesus is the only way I can get to heaven, if Jesus is the only means by which I may be in a right relationship with God, then that is a blow to my big fat ego. That pricks my pride. That tells me that I can never, ever earn my salvation through anything that I can do, but I am in total and utter need of Christ and His mercy for my salvation. Now, there are two things you can do when you come across a rock in the middle of the path. You can trip and fall over it, and that's unfortunately what many still do with Jesus. Or else, verse 33, you can stand on it. You can stumble over Jesus, or you can stand in the promises of God and trust on Christ, who is the solid rock. Why then, dear friends, might any of us here continue to resist the irresistible God? Why push Him from exercising His legitimate rule and reign over our lives? Why not instead recognize who He is, and in confessing God's mercy and His grace and His sovereignty, submit to Him gladly and willingly, and find in Him this assurance that will never, ever, verse 33, be put to shame. And so to Him, the one and only true God, be all glory and honor and praise both now and forever. My Lord, I did not choose you, for that could never be. My heart would still refuse you had you not chosen me. You took the sin that stained me. You cleansed me, made me new. For you, Lord, had ordained me that I should live in you. Unless your grace had called me and taught my opening mind, the world would have enthralled me to heaven glories blind. My heart knows none above you. For you I long, I thirst. And know that if I love you, Lord, you have loved me first. Unless your spirit claimed me, I'd still be bound in sin. Yet Christ alone has saved me, and now I am found in Him. And when I stand in glory, and faith gives way to sight, your joy will crown the chosen in everlasting light. And so we take time to pray for uh, those we know who are serving in the forces, and for our PCI chaplains currently serving, along with their families, James Burnett, Mark Donald, Simon Hamilton, <clears throat> Mark Henderson, Ivan Linton, Graham McConville, Michael McCormick, Edward McKenzie, Jonathan Newell, Heather Rendell, Paul Swin, Philip Wilson, and Brent Vanderlind, and pray for them strength and courage to bring the love and assurance of Christ into many dark and difficult and dangerous situations. 
And Father God, we pray for all for whom this Remembrance Day is especially poignant. Not only those who have lost family members and friends in the two world wars, but in far more recent conflicts, including the Falklands, Iraq, Afghanistan, and closer to home during the Troubles. We dare not take such loss lightly, but lovingly entrust them and all who have been injured or disabled as a result of civil unrest or battle, for soldiers and for civilians who have experienced mental distress, those for whom their faith has been shaken and have been um, destroyed. Father God, may the presence and comfort of Christian people bring about help and healing, and may the hope of resurrection encourage their spirits. And Father God, we bring before you other places in our world currently experiencing the wickedness and cruelty of war, and especially again our Heavenly Father for Ukraine. And ask, gracious Lord, that you might restrain the hands of wicked men, prevent an escalation of war, and bless your people in that part of the world. And for those who are refugees here in this land, may they find in you their rest and hope. And finally, for all who seek the good of this world in all its fragility and vulnerability and need, of physical and ecological and emotional and spiritual healing, we pray, enable them and us to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God over all and forever to be praised. And these and all our prayers we make in our Saviour's name. Amen. Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast with worship services at 11am and 7pm every Sunday. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.